He spent over eight and a half years behind bars for a crime he did not commit in Louisiana. Let's bring him on. Mr. Utico Briley, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine, Mr. Kane. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, really a crazy story that, that you have here. Um, before we get into it, I always start here. Uh, this happens to you when you're 19 years old. So tell me the young man that you were at 19 before all of this happened to you. I'm going to be completely honest with you, Mr. Kane. Um, you know, by me growing up, you know, my father was in and out of prison. Like, you know, my mother, I was the oldest out of her nine kids. So just at that age, like, I was still like real lost. Like, as far as just unsure, like, of my potentials or what I could do in life or what I could. So honestly, like, at that time, like, I wasn't really focused. Like, even in the legal world, like, when I did catch the charge, like, I just was so green to the whole process. Like, so, you know, I'm gonna just say at 19, I was real naive to a lot of things. Yeah, so what happens is uh, there's basically, is there is there an armed robbery in November of 2012? Is that correct? Yes, sir. They had an armed robbery in on November 27th, the same day I was arrested early in the morning, like early in the morning, two, two o'clock in the morning on November 27th, they had an armed robbery took place in mid city. And you were arrested. You had a gun on you for protection. You had an actual gun on you, right? Yes, sir. Um, actually in 2012, that same year between, I want to say January and September, I had actually, I had about like four or five friends that got killed in the same two blocks that I was hanging on. Mm, right. So you had a gun, you had a gun for protection. The police pull you over and, or they stop you rather. And because you have this gun, they, with no other evidence, I think the only evidence was there was a guy with a hoodie. That was the only evidence. Uh, they put you behind bars. Ex explain that to the audience. Well, I'm going to be completely honest with you since, you know, it's, since it's all over with now, but the police actually knew I didn't commit the crime. Like when they arrested me, they knew I didn't commit the crime. Like they just, they, they purposely like matched me up to a suspect. If that makes any sense to you, like, <laughs> I know it, it might sound like far fetched. No, it but makes sense. I've, I've covered you know, even worse. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And it really was confirmed like during my appeal process. Like once Ms. Bazelon started digging in my files and trying to do certain stuff, like it really became evident to me like, wow, like I'm really like I'm involved in something way bigger than me like with these because it's like, all right. I already felt like everybody in the room, including the judge, knew I didn't commit the crime. So now it's like I'm appealing and the DA is doing everything they could to stop her just from getting simple evidence and stuff. Like, so it's like, wow. But at the time, the police, like, you know, they had two different police reports. Like, it, they purpose, they knew I didn't commit the crime. Like, it wasn't even about it was just about like, I'm gonna be honest, like, you know, I was a young black male, like the, the what they had going on in New Orleans was just like every young black male between like these ages, we just trying to get them off the street. Like, mm. it wasn't just even about like right or wrong. Like that's what I found out in this whole process. Like it, it, a lot of times it ain't even, a, it's not about right or wrong. Do you know how your name even came up? Why did they come after you specifically? Um, all right. When I was arrested, the police was questioning me about, you know, like other dudes in the neighborhood or, and by me not wanting to cooperate or answering the questions, they became angry and frustrated. They became angry and frustrated. So the officer actually told me like, you don't have to talk to me, but you know, I got something for you. He's like, I got something for you. And 
it never dawned wow. on me what he was talking about until I got booked. When I got booked and they read me my charges, I asked, I asked the lady, I'm like, hold on, you know, I write the firearm charge. That's cool. Um, where does armed robbery come from? And the lady like, well, I should be asking you that, Mr. Briley. <laughs> wow. And it, it really like, you know, I'm laughing right now because just thinking back, like, I really didn't know what was going on. Like, throughout the whole process, like, it's like, before I looked up, I had 65 years. I was 19 years old with 65 years. And did you even know anything about this armed robbery? Were you even aware of it? No, sir. No, sir. I, I'm gonna honestly tell you, it. I'm gonna honestly tell you, I don't know who committed it. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of anything. Like, until I got my discovery packet and started reading details, like, you know, I'm finding out as they, as the people find, like, you know, they got advantage on me because I don't know what's going on. Mm. So, you know, obviously there's race involved here, there's class involved here, but just explain to the audience though, how in the world did they, I mean, we know how, but I'm just saying, how in the world do they manage to convict you when there's no evidence, when the only evidence is this ridiculous eyewitness testimony, I saw a guy with the hoodie. That seems like reasonable doubt through and through. How in the world did they manage to convince a jury that you were guilty with no evidence? Well, first, we can start off with the jury selection. Mm. During jury selection, they actually asked the jurors, would you be willing to convict someone if we had no physical evidence, just testimony. That was actually a question asked in um, jury selection. But once- If you'd be willing to convict someone with no physical evidence, just testimony. No physical evidence, just what testimony. The so they had one lady, she says, no, I, I wouldn't do it because the testimony could be false. Like, you know, right? it, it could be false. Like, you know, the testimony, a, a human could say anything out their mouth and, you know, like, you know, the evidence, the physical evidence wouldn't lie. The judge excluded every juror that said that, that, that answered that question the wrong way. Every juror that said they wouldn't, they wouldn't convict off testimony, he made them get up and leave out the room right there. Wow. But also, all right, when I got released, they had a new judge in the section, Miss Angel Harris, a very wonderful woman from, from she actually from the state of Florida, but she does a lot of good things in New Orleans. Now, she, she's black. Now, when she won the, 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 the judge spot, the old judge say, well, like, she didn't have to do anything. Like, all she had to do was be black. Like, you know, like anybody could have won. Oh. Hold wait, hold hold on a second. When the black woman judge wins, yes, Ms. the Angel old Harris. judge who's out, the old judge. So when 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 Miss Judge Harris wins, Honorable Judge Harris wins, the old white judge who's now Mr. out of Franz, that seat, Mr. Franz Ziblis. So he Franz says the Ziblis. only reason why she won is because she's black. Man, Mr. Kane. Wow. So, but this that's why what, elections matter. That's why elections matter. Exactly. So <laughs> if this man was actually, now he was already known for that, just, you know, making all kind of outrageous outbursts and, you know, just saying all kind of stuff and, you know, harassing women like on the cool, like, but he just, he said that like on, like, I think he reported this like to the news, like this was in a news outlet. He was so proud of like, it. It's like, wow, like, you is that evident? That's what I, you know, like, you know, when I was young, when I was younger, going into like, I didn't think like that was still the world we lived in. Like, mm. I didn't think, you know, like I got told you I was naive to a lot of stuff. And wasn't there another story? Was it the prosecutor that he had photos on his desk of the five black men? He 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 got sentenced to death. Is, is that accurate? There was a photo. There was a photo on his desk of the five black men he sentenced to death. The prosecutor, yep. the DA, someone like that. No, that might that that's actually an ex prosecutor who was representing me as a lawyer at the beginning of my case, Mr. Jim Williams, Mr. James Williams. 
and he had photos on his desk of the black man that he sentenced to death. Yeah, when you he was um, proud of it. He's a defense lawyer now. Mr. Williams is a defense, he's a defense lawyer. lawyer now. But uh, he used to be a prosecutor in Orleans Parish. So when and you this walk is your into first, his office, your first defender. Yeah, he um he actually filed for the wrong time on my alibi, which is you know that was part of the reason why I got convicted too. He um, mm. but you know Mr. Williams is a defense lawyer now, but. When you step into his office, there's a picture of him leaning on an electric chair. You know, they they basically glorifying him for the amount of people that he sentenced to death. You know, he you know, he 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 glorifying the amount of people that he got sentenced to the death penalty. And I want to remind people, uh, this is in 2012. This is not in 19, you know. 71. This is 2012. We're talking about this. So in uh, 2000, April of 2013, uh, you are convicted. Like you said, your original sentence is 65 years behind bars. Uh, when you hear that and you're in that courtroom, what, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? I mean, I'm going to be honest, Mr. Kane. By the time I had got sentenced, you know, um, like I told you, the judge was already known for making all kind of outbursts, but he had already made like a statement in court informing me like, you know, Mr. Bradley, you need to plead guilty because if you lose, I'm not going to lose no sleep giving you 50 years. Wait, you so, were offered a plea deal of 12 years, correct? And you refused yes, to take it. 12 years. You refused years, to take it. 85%. I would have did about nine or 10 years almost. And you refused to take it because you knew that you were innocent. Like I, I was, I told, I was naive. Like I felt like. No, that's not naive. I, I get it. I get it. No, you, it, you, it, it you actually guilty. was, Mr. King. It was naive. <laughs> it was naive for me to think that I had a fair mm. chance. Like mm. for me to even think that, all right, like I say, the system is based on right and wrong. That was naive just even thinking like mm. that. It was naive of mm. me even just thinking like, wow, well, you know, this gonna go, you know, like on TV, like law and order. Like, you know, I'm thinking ain't no way, ain't no way possible I can get convicted on this crime I didn't do. And, you know, it's just so many loopholes and, you know, my lawyer filed for the wrong alibi. So it's like everything that could have went wrong did. <laughs> everything that could have went retrospect- wrong did. And I was like, I just was shocked. Do you wish you would have took the plea deal in retrospect? At at the time, when I was at in prison time. and it was getting close to eight years and eight, nine years, that's all that was coming through my head. I said, I wish that's I would have took it. Thinking. But right now, mm. of course not. I'm glad I didn't right. take it. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. glad I didn't take it. Like I'm glad I went through the same the journey and the process I went through. I'm glad I'm I'm mm. glad because to me it's like everything happened for a reason. So it really was one big learning experience. So again, you're convicted of 65 years. You go behind bars. Uh, you're there and behind bars for eight and a half years. How are you? Uh, you're, you're a young man. Uh, how are you getting by, surviving, uh, being being in prison? What's your what was your strategy to survive? Man, I'm gonna I'm be honest with you, um, Mr. Kane. I'm not about to sit. I'm not about to sit on your on your show and lie to you, like. I, I never stole anything from nobody, like stuff like that. But just like, you got to think like a lot of my family members and friends like turn their back on me. Like they wrote me off like it's never coming home. So, you know, it's different when, you know, I'm doing six months and they know I'm getting out. So, you know, they'll look out for me and they'll do this. But now it's like, well, oh, you got 65. So you might not never get back. So, all this I'm doing for you, I might I never get it in return. So you finding out like who really love you, like that's the only people that's gonna be there, which is really almost nobody. Like, so like, I ain't gonna lie, Mr. King, I didn't do everything in prison to survive. Like I ain't never cleaned nobody's shoes or nothing, but like I didn't sold like cigarettes and stuff. Like I didn't been involved in like, like, 
gambling, like, you know, just in prison, like just all type of hustles, like just to survive, like, cause you know, a lot of my family had turned their back on me. Like, even, you know, I'm a, I hate to say it, like, you know, my mom, like, you know, my grandmother, like grandfather, uh, you know, my father, like he did a little, but you know, even him, like in his head, you know, I ain't, I ain't never getting out. Like, so. Wow. What do you feel like was your lowest moment in prison? One of my lowest moments was right before I met my lawyer. Right before I met my lawyer, um, I had I had stabbed another inmate and really almost killed him. And they had me on like extended lockdown in the cell with another dude like 23 hours a day. And we had been in the cell like six months together. Like, so I'm gonna say like, that was my lowest point to where I started really accepting almost my situation, not accepting, but like, man, I might lose my life in here. Like, uh, you know, I had a knife fight with another inmate, like right around that time. But I remember like during those times where, you know, I was getting stabbed and stabbing people. Like I, I was involved in all that cause I felt like this might be my permanent home. Listen, I, I want to get to how you are, how you're free, but um, how you get your freedom. But I do want to ask you, uh, just so you're speaking of solitary confinement for uh, for us six months. I had a friend of mine who was in solitary with with uh, nobody else. I'm sorry, it was you and another inmate. Um, you know, you guys were in this same cell for basically six months. And what do you think about that? Do you think that solitary confinement should be outlawed? Should it be illegal? Should they not be able to do that to somebody? Do you think it's necessary? As somebody who experienced it, what, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I done been on it and <laughs> it's way worse than being in a cell with somebody. <laughs> so mm. it's like one of the worst forms of punishment, but you, I mean, it might sound crazy, but I wouldn't say it need to be outlawed, Mr. Um, Mr. King, cause you gonna have to face yourself in them. Like, that's like probably some of the times where I really gathered together my best thoughts of, you know, self-improvement thoughts. Like, you know, when you're in there by yourself, like, like I say, it's a terrible form of punishment. Cause like eventually, like you, you almost start losing your mind, like, but you gonna, you gonna have to face yourself. Like you gonna have to examine yourself. So if you in this situation and self-correction is your goal, then that's one of the best ways to be able to do it. Cause no distractions and like, you know, you like, you're going to deal with yourself, but I'm gonna just say, you know, over long periods of time, like, you know, it could be damaging just mentally. Cause I didn't, it had several times to where like, I felt like my mind just was almost slipping away from me. But he had a friend, he told me when he got out of solitary, he had to remember how to speak. Like it took him a few minutes because he was going so long, not speaking to somebody. He had to remember how to talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's wild. It's heavy. Or just in a cell period, though, you know, you got to get used to back being around people and moving because it's like that's jail inside jail. So it's like you inside a jail. And when you when they let you in population, it's like you free again almost. So it's like you gotta get back to used to touching people and it's crazy. Like I still like, like I still like it still like affect me in certain ways. Like it still affects me in certain ways, like all those times I did in the cell, like, like it still affect me in certain ways. Like <laughs> but yeah. Um, me and my cell, I ain't, we was in there for six months together. I did eight months all together on lockdown, but mm -hmm. like we established like a beautiful relationship to where that dude's almost like my little brother. Like he still called me right now, mm. but everything happened so, for a reason Dur during that yeah. time. I actually contacted my lawyer who, who eventually getting me out. Yeah. So explain that. So how are you eventually released and exonerated? And you were just released in March of 2021. So less than a year ago, but explain to people how you uh, get your freedom. All right. We're going to rewind to about 
November 2019. They said 2020. Yeah, November 2019. All right. I had just got off of um um lockdown for like five months. I had a I had a knife fight because some dudes they stole something from me. And like when we went to fight, and like it was two against one, and like they had knives. But all right, this made me really get in the mind state to where like next time I get into it with somebody, like I'm gonna just stab them. Like, cause that was going on. Like I had to adapt to my environment. So when I stabbed the second guy. I was on lockdown for eight months. And like I was telling you earlier, like during this time, like I was really like examining self, like trying to improve myself. Like, so I was listening to the radio cause they had classes that they was letting us go to out of the cell. They was letting us go to these little, you know, anger management classes, uh, you know, we might talk about this. And I was going to the classes cause you know, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get myself better. So I was listening to the radio so I don't fall back to sleep to go to the class. And I heard Miss Emily Bazelon on NPR radio. Mm. All right. She was on NPR radio releasing her book, Charged. The book, Charged, is about a little girl that was falsely convicted of murdering her mother. Another guy who was in New York fighting a weapons charge, a teenager, right? So... She elaborating about the teenager. And I'm like, wow, this dude, just like me. Like almost exactly the situations I was in. Like he in New York, he hanging around probably people he don't need to be around, but he's too young to realize it. And now he didn't got caught up in carrying a gun cause his, his, his friends stuff are happening to him. You know, he in all kinds of dangerous places. So he ended up getting a gun charge and she ends up following him fighting the weapons charge. And you know, she's elaborating on that during her segment on NPR. So when I when they let me out to use the phone, like, you know, use the phone probably once a week, but the next time I use the phone, I told my sister to look up Emily Bazelon name and contact info. You know, cause you know, during my incarceration, I had wrote like all kinds of law schools, like all kinds of lawyers. And you know, I just was shooting in the dark. Like, you know, I got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So once my sister wrote, I mean, looked up Miss Emily Bazelon, it gave me info to inbox at Yale, at Yale, I mean, Yale, yeah, Yale University, like a, no, at New York Times, I'm sorry. Like a, a little PO box or a little mailbox at New York Times. So I wrote her, explained to her that I was just like the dude in her book, except when I caught a gun charge, they booked me with an armed robbery I didn't commit. And, you know, I was completely honest with her. You know, I, I ain't lie, I ain't sugarcoat nothing. I told her my whole situation. All right, I send the letter off. I get off lockdown probably about, um, I was on lockdown probably from November to about August, August of 2020. All right, so now, me and me and Miss Oh, I had a, a a a pen pal who actually I call her my mom now because that's a relationship we end up establishing. Like once I got out and once I was in there for so long, but every time I used to write someone to try to help me, she would contact them too out on the outside. Like you know, she might send them a letter, send them an email, call them. So I think she either emailed Emily. Yeah, she sent Emily an email or something and let her know, like, well, look, my son wrote this address and, you know, told her who I was. And I guess like a little brief, you know, intro of me. So Miss Bazelon went through her mail, which was stacked to the ceiling <laughs> and found my letter because my, my mom told her that I had wrote her. So, you know, after I got off lockdown, like she just popped up and wrote me on JPay. That's like the little electronic little email and little system that the prison used to let us use. So Miss Emily Bazelon wrote me on JPay, and we just took off from there. I mean, you know, we started talking and then, you know, she's like, well, just send me all your paperwork you got and I'm gonna find you a good lawyer. I'm gonna find you a lawyer. So I sent her all my paperwork and she was having, she contacted the Innocent Project. They turned me down. She contacted this person, this person, this person, all of them turned me down. So she like, well, look, I promise you I'm gonna get you a lawyer. I'm about to talk to my sister. 
like a sister. Yeah, she like my sister. She ain't even give me a name. So like the next day or two days later, Miss Laura Bazelon pop up on my on my screen on a, on my email screen, and she wanna um she sending me a uh what is it called I forgot an agreement, you know yeah, some, like, a retainer. like a contract yeah, for yeah. for her to represent me. Like this was her first message to me. Hi Utico, I'm Emily's sister. Look, I'm, I got your paperwork. I'm gonna send you this, and we are gonna talk. You know, before we start talking, I gotta have you sign this and do this. So she sent it to me and I sent it back to her and everything was almost magic from there. But I told you, all right, this around December, with this, this, this is December, 2020 or 2019. I'm getting my years kind of messed up. Yeah, I wanna say December, 2000. 20. Yeah, December 2020. Um, Ms. Bazelon and some students from San Francisco come visit me. Just right before the pandemic like kicked off. They come and visit me. And you know, I meet the law students, and you know, we basically like fall in love with each other. Like the law students didn't want to leave the prison. Like they was just saying, like, wow, we having so much fun with Utico. Like, and it was cool for me because you know, I, I haven't been around you know, regular people my age and so long, like everybody I've been around been criminals. <laughs> so I was having fun with the college students. So, you know, they started fighting, working on my case. And I started telling them like all kinds of stuff they could do. And, you know, we was basically working together. But as we started getting closer, it's like the D, oh, they, they had an election for DA. But during the election, they had Mr. Canizero. And he was fighting us like, you know, my lawyer trying to get records and files because I had missing pages on my transcripts. The DA don't want to give it to her. She filed all the way to a higher court, make him give it to her. Now they blacking it out, redacting the paperwork. I'm like, wow, like what's going on here? Like, you know, it, you know, but I guess they finding out like, you know, it was all kind of underhanded stuff going on in my case and they were trying to hide it. So, um, Eventually, Mr. Canizero got voted out of office. My judge got mm. voted out off the stand. And after that, I was released in two months. Wow. And you were after, finally released. After March the DA 19th. stopped fighting me and after the prejudiced racist judge got off the stand. <laughs> wow. March 19th, 2021, you're finally released. It's been almost a year. How are you, how are you getting by? How are you adjusting? How are you doing? I'm not like, it's still, you know, I'm gonna be reminded every day, you know, that I was in prison. Uh, I'm gonna be reminded like every day in some way, you know, but you know, I'm grateful no matter what, like, it don't matter what, I'm just grateful. So a lot of my days, like, I'm not sad. I'm not disappointed for, I don't have this, I don't have that. Or I'm not in this position. You know, I'm just grateful to be out here. I'm just grateful for the stuff I do have, but, it's just, you know, I had transferred my parole to Atlanta. All right. So I had got a job on a Macy's truck. You know, we d dropping off furniture and stuff. You know, Laura and them, my lawyer, Emily, you know, they're proud of me. It's my first job. You know, I'm proud of myself, really. And all right, I'm working for about a week. And then they laid me off telling me, like, my background check came back. Mm. So it's like. But, you, but you're wrongfully. What 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 was yeah was I was the previous I was wrongfully charge? convicted but um the I previous had charge. I, I had I had another charge I was out on bond for a gun charge in Jefferson Parish too right. and they didn't drop right. the charge Orleans Parish dropped their charges Jefferson Parish didn't drop their charge so I was actually still on parole once I was released so they put you in eight years in bondage <laughs> they put you eight years behind bars and they don't want to drop a gun charge from nearly 10 years ago. No, and Jefferson Parish didn't want to. They don't, that's they don't. just that's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So you mean to tell me eight years in, in bondage and you're out there with a the job and you get a background check that comes back for some charge nine, 10 years ago, whatever, and you got fired? Yeah, I got that's fired. Just, they, um... That's just how <laughs> it's just inhumane. And that's why I tell you, like, you know, like every, like I'm gonna be reminded 
Like, I don't know, like, I'm going to be honest, Mr. Kane, like, even on Christmas, like, because, you know, I let New York Times and people follow me around with camp with microphones and, like, get inside my life when I first got out. So, you know, like, all my family relationships are, like, broken, like, you know, because I was gone so long. Mm. Like, I, I, I spent Christmas in a room by myself. And it's like, I had to like get up and like shake myself back cause I started really feeling like last Christmas when I was in a cell by myself. So mm. it's like, man, like, hold on, let me get out of that. Like, you know, I sit in the room too long and I go to feel like I'm in a cell. Like my 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 friends come like checking on me. Like, man, you gotta get out of the room. They start to act like you're in a cell. Like, so it's like every day I'll be reminded, but you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's all right. It's good. I guess I'm just grateful. I'm happy to be free. Like, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, stuff that I can't yeah. do or stuff that, you know, I have trouble with. I just do my best of the stuff I could. How, how are you and your family now? You just mentioned Christmas, but your mom and how, how are y'all now? I mean, you know, like I told you, all right. How, it's awkward because all these people turned their back on me and wrote me off. And now I pop back up out the blue in your face. So it's like half of half, half of y'all don't even know how to approach me. Like even say, hey, like without feeling guilty or without, you know. And, you know, like it's like all my relationships, like even like I say, even for Christmas, it's like, well, who I'm gonna go by and like probably have a good time. You know, probably my grandmother. I probably could have went with my grandmother. But you know, even it's like my sisters, like me and my sisters, like all our relationships, like awkward and off and stuff. Cause uh, I've been gone so long. Uh, this happened while I was in prison, and they, you know, it's just, it's like it's every day I'm be reminded, like every day I'm be reminded. But it's good. Uh, before you go, tell me about the the Promise of Justice Initiative in New Orleans and San Francisco Law School. Well, all right. I had the law students in the University of San Francisco. I had about seven law students along with Ms. Laura Bazelon, the professor. And they couldn't, they legally couldn't practice law in Louisiana. So they used Promise of Justice, Promise Justice, Promise of Justice Initiative yep. in New Orleans as local counsel. Yeah, like, you know. They did it. They pulled it off. Like they, they did all kind of Facebook investigations. Um, they, they fought. They fought. They fought. Like hands down. And we still all like most of my law students. We still like you know they check on me every week. We talk all the time. You know. So it's kind of like I, I got a new believe. family. That's a that's great. I just can't believe you're on probation. That's just it's just. This is crazy. I just can't believe. Are, are they fighting to get you off probate? I mean, this is a previous charge. Are they, they, they are they, I just don't understand. Oh my God. I mean, we tried. Sense. I'm going I'm to be honest with you, Mr. King. Um, if I would have stayed in New Orleans when I came, when I was released, mm. I would have been off by now. But when I got home, like, they had so much stuff going on, like, in New Orleans. Like, I'm talking yeah. about, like, my first week home. Like, I can't even sleep. They got gunshots and stuff. Yeah. So it's like, I want to get out of this out. environment. But if I move to Atlanta, instead of being on parole for six months, I'm going to be on parole for a year and six months. So it's mm -hmm. like, stay down here for six months and risk getting caught up in all this or risk losing your life or move to Atlanta and do the extra time on parole. I moved to Atlanta and did the extra time on parole. Mm. So uh, you know, before you go, I, I, I do want to ask you, uh, I know this is a big question, but there is so much good, gun Mr. violence. King, you can ask me anything. You can ask me anything. All the doors <laughs> open. Good. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's difficult, right? Because there's so much gun violence in our in our communities. And there's so much talk about how we control gun violence. Is it stricter gun laws? Uh, you know, you talked about that you the reason why you even had a weapon uh, was because of uh, you were afraid because you saw your friends get shot and killed. Yeah, my uh, best friend, my best friend, my best friend got killed right in front of my face. Yeah, so and I felt uh, terrible. I, I couldn't do nothing. Like I didn't even have a gun to try to shoot back. Like, I felt terrible. Right, and that's why you had this gun. 
uh, not because you wanted to feel like some big, strong dude. You had it because for protection of yourself. So what's what's the answer for for uh, gun violence in our communities? What, what do you think is it stricter gun laws? I mean, how how do we change this? What, what are your thoughts when you hear this conversation? Um, I'm gonna just say guns don't kill people, people kill people. So, you know, it's like, we gotta go to the root of the problem. Like it's way bigger than just making these gun laws tougher, uh, giving people more time in prison, uh, removing guns off the shelf. You gotta get to the problem of why are these people using, why are they killing each other? Mm -hmm. Why are they killing each other? Why are these 13 year olds running around with guns in the first place? Why are you not in somebody's classroom? Mm. You know, we got to get to the root of the problem like that. Like, you know, that's why, like, you know, nowadays, like, I'm not into setting bad examples for the youth. Like, I'm not into, you know, having kids see the wrong stuff and hear the wrong stuff because I just saw, like, firsthand, you know, where where that's going to lead you at, you know, in the all right, in a few years, you're gonna be doing this. Like, you know, if I don't, if we don't bring you this way and get you away from this, in a few years, you're gonna be where I'm at. Like, you know, you're gonna be in the streets. So it's like, you know, we could, we gotta get to the root of the problem. Like, you know, why are they even killing each other? Like, why are you selling drugs? And, you know, we gotta get to those problems, like in the society. Like, you could just put the gun laws up, but you could take the guns off the shelf. I mean, people still gonna, they gonna get a gun and they still gonna, until you get rid of these problems of why are these people even living this lifestyle? Like, <laughs> mm. that's the problem we got to address. <laughs> yeah, and that's the story's oldest time, right? You know, poverty creates violence, exactly. lack of jobs, or you get a job and you're getting paid $8 an hour. I mean, it's just, it's, it's I rough. mean, you know, you look at, I, all right, New Orleans, for example. I mean, I'm not sure if it's still like this, but I know at one time, you know, we bought them at a barrel. Education. Yep. I'm pretty sure education plays some kind of part in the murder rate or the oh, violent yeah. crime rate. Oh, yeah. Because if everybody was educated better, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be out here uh, risking 50 years for no reason. <laughs> That's right. So, and especially know, if the end, schools are terrible, the teachers don't give a damn. They're not even teaching you. I mean, it's 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 a lot. Yeah, I, uh, read, I do want to say I, this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I didn't read it like you know. I read a lot of books and just brought my mind to a lot of different places. So, you know, it, I got a kind of abstract view on a lot of situations. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm. It's probably much smarter than uh, a lot of folks out here today. You see what's happening in the country. You know what I mean? People are just caught up in misinformation and disinformation. I do want to say this, the state of Louisiana, of course, has not compensated you, which is uh, disgusting. And you've been on they parole. actually saying like, I might not even be eligible for compensation. Like, and like, that's the way like my lawyers are breaking it down to me because they haven't like really even attempted. So it's really like, I will be on my own trying to even venture and do it. But I mean, I know for a fact, like, all right, I had a friend they dad did about 16 years in prison for a murder they didn't commit. Now, they had to fight like five or six years to even try to get their money. And Louisiana got a limit anyway. Like Louisiana got a limit. Like it's, on, it's only a limit. They cut you off. It don't matter how much time you did. Like they cut you off at a certain number. Like I don't want to lie, but it, it ain't that much. I'm going to think it's a million dollars. So it's like. Well, if. If folks can uh, donate, uh, let me give folks your cash app if they're able to support. I know it's tough times, but if you can, your cash app is dollar sign Y-U-T-I-C-O-B-R-I-L-E-Y. That's Utico Briley, dollar sign Y-U-T-I-C-O-B-R-I-L-E-Y. If they can support your cash app, 